Hello and welcome to another episode of the Golden Hour Podcast brought to you by the Polar Pro Studio. I'm your host, Dave Mays, and today is an exciting day because a lot of crazy things happened in the news. But before we get to that, let's just admire this amazing setup that I have today. It may look semi-normal if you're watching the video, but this episode I'm using the brand new ATEM Mini Pro Extreme ISO that I was telling you about in the previous episode. I have it here on my table, and you're looking at the main shot, which, by the way, I'm actually shooting on my trusty Olympus EM-1 Mark III today instead of my C70. The C70 is set up at the opposite. We have a big shoot tomorrow, so I didn't want to have to tear all that down. So I'm using my personal camera today, and I now have this switcher uh, to use for the podcast. So before we rolled uh, this episode, I hit record on the switcher. Um, shoot, I need an extra camera to show you this, but there's a button here that says record. And it's recorded onto a little SSD drive that's plugged into the switcher itself. Uh, you can see in the video, I'm holding it up. Um, now I have the ability, watch this, I take my finger and push this button. And now you're looking at my computer display uh, at the push of a button. Now I can just push another button and boom, picture in picture. I'm in the corner. I even added a little white border to it and I could put myself on the top left. I could put myself top right, bottom right. I can do this thing. I could do this kind of thing. It's an amazing tool and uh, I love it. This thing is going to change this podcast. Um, well, in theory, if I don't have any mistakes, completely cut out all the editing and post because once I'm done with this edit or once I'm done with this podcast, all the changes, all the switches that I make here uh, will be recorded uh, as one file. It's all baked in. Or if I would rather actually go in and edit and make any changes or tweaks, maybe I do make a mistake and I want to cut that out. And by the way, guys, I am not perfect by any means. Uh, often on this podcast, I make mistakes and have to change it in post. Uh, little do you know, uh, I edit these things. <laughs> but... Uh, it saves everything as a DaVinci Resolve file, which I can then XML over to Final Cut, or if you're a Premiere user, you could also XML it to Premiere. Um, if it's just basic edits, might as well just do it in Resolve. It's already there. It's native. Resolve is so fast these days. It's so reliable. Um, Resolve for many years has been great, but it just seems like they've really turned the corner recently. And honestly, if I wasn't so invested in Final Cut, I would strongly consider Resolve because it is dual platform. You can use Windows, you can use Mac, um, and it's free. So the barrier of entry is just like Fortnite or, uh, you know, what else? Um, Call of Duty, the the new one that's free. Um, Minecraft isn't free, but it's essentially free. But yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how accessible these tools are these days. Um, and so yeah, the switcher, here we go. My one shot here, uh, two shot picture in picture. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That's all I'm going to be using today, but this saves me a ton of time in post because now I don't have to edit anything uh, in terms of, you know, I was manually doing picture in picture. I was manually cutting uh, when I would talk about my computer screen. And there's always issues with screen recording software. I would use um, this app here called ScreenFlow. Um, it's a very popular app and many people use it and I have used it quite a bit with, with good, um, you know, I've had a decent experience with it, but to be honest, I've had issues where it drops out or things fail on it. Uh, and it's a real pain in the neck. Um, the only thing I am sort of relying on still today is this app called audio hijack, which I've been using as my primary, uh, video or audio recording tool for a long time. Uh, my friend Tyler Stallman, who's been a guest on the show, uh, recommended this to me. Turns out a lot of podcasters use this app. It's just a really straightforward, very reliable audio recording tool. I mean, you could use logic, you could use GarageBand, uh, you can use audacity, which is free. Um, but I just have really loved this app. It's very simple. You can, you know, record different things from Skype or Zoom or, you know, whatever from here. I keep hitting the mic. Sorry about that. Uh, in my case, I'm literally just inputting my Scarlet 2i2 into the Mac. I'm going on and on about the tech here, but uh, I'm a tech guy. I'm a gear guy. So, what you know, sue me. Um, 
But yeah, that's the setup for today. I'm pretty stoked about it. And uh, this will be refined with more uh, podcasts in the future, I'm sure. But for now, I'm happy with this little setup. And it's definitely extreme to have the uh, the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO instead of just the standard Mini Pro ISO, which only has four inputs. Obviously, I'm only using two inputs here, uh, so it's completely unnecessary to have eight inputs, which the Extreme has. Um, but I need that for my job, so this is the unit that we ended up getting. So enough about that. Let's get on to some news because we have a lot of crazy awesome news today. The EOS R3 from Canon has finally been dropped. Uh, all the YouTubers that you know you would expect got their hands on with it today. Uh, I was woken up with that, uh, you know, the subscription feed of all my friends and, and people, um, you know, doing reviews. Um, the R3, it's $5,999, so $6,000. To put that into perspective, um, how much is the C70? I believe it's actually that same price, isn't it? It might even be $500 cheaper. It is. It's $5,500. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it. If you're a videographer, a cinematographer, um, get the C70. I mean, if it's if you have that kind of money and you're looking for a video tool, the R3 is not going to be it. The R3 really is kind of, I guess, in a way the next level of what I'm holding in my hand, the Canon EOS 1D, the old DSLR, the 1DC uh, version, which came out in 2012, I believe, maybe 2014. This camera was $15,000 when it came out, which is just absurd. I have no idea why they priced it uh, that way. It must have been because it was just a lower, uh, they, they made so few of these. Um, I've heard, uh, from EOS HD that they only made like a couple thousand of them in general. And they just didn't sell well. Cause well, obviously they're 15 grand. Um, but this camera was my favorite camera for years. I picked it up secondhand. The first one I bought was $2,500. Uh, the second one I bought was $1,800. And then I think I sold that one. And then I rebought it again when I was doing YouTube stuff to do a video about it. Bought this one for around 1500-ish. Maybe it was also close to 18. I don't know. Um, you can get them still for about 1500. It's crazy. They hold their value like crazy. Um, 4K recording, Canon log on this bad boy, recorded in MP or a motion JPEG, not MP4. The codec was terrible. Like most computers could not handle this at all. Um, but it was the main tool that Connor and I used at the beginning of my kind of career on YouTube, uh, with Kino Tika. And it kind of just remained like this kind of, I don't know, dream camera of mine. Um, and I've held on to it. Uh, it actually doesn't work anymore. For some reason, it just kind of stopped working one day. Um, I should definitely send it into Canon, get them to repair it. That way I have a, a working unit. Um, but yeah, the R3 is kind of the mirrorless version of the 1DC because it does have some amazing video features. It can shoot 6K, 60 frames per second raw video, 4K at 120 frames per second with 10-bit internal. Um, it's got the five-axis image stabilization. It's got the flip-out selfie screen that we all love and, and want. Um, I don't know if we all want it. Let me know if, if you disagree with me. I, I want it. I love it. I actually love how now we've got the little nipple switcher uh, on the back. You know what I'm talking about? Um, this kind of switcher thing, it, it's, it was found on the, uh, on the 7D originally. I think that's where I saw it first, where you have a little switch to go between photo and video. And the reason that's so great is because... Um, you can set your photo settings to be whatever you want your photo set settings to be, which is always different than your video settings. And then you set your video settings to be exactly what, what you want your video settings to be. For example, uh, if you shoot log for video, you know, you want all that dynamic range and, and all the fancy, you know, ability to color grade and post, but you don't want to take pictures and log. You want to take pictures if you're shooting JPEG and like a, a more standard profile or, you know, raw, um, also if you're doing the 180 degree shutter angle rule, you're shooting your shutter at, you know, 148th of a second in theory. Um, 
if you're shooting 24 frames per second, you obviously don't want to shoot your shutter at that for photo uh, very often. So this is great that they've added this back on here. I'm still getting used to uh, switching everything back and forth, by the way. Um, so bear with me. It's got dual card slots, a CFast um, card slot and an SD card slot. Um, I believe that is, let me look at the exact specs. I believe that is a CF Extreme or like two or something, CF, CF, CF Express type B, okay? Um, and it can do UHS two uh, on the other SD card. Some pros are saying that they wish that it was both CF uh, cards um, because they're faster and the people that are going to be using this are people who are shooting sports and things. Um, but it is nice that it comes with both. In the video that I saw with uh, DP Review with my friend Jordan Drake and uh, Chris Nichols, um, he specifically talks about how much smaller it feels in the hand, even though it looks beefy and chunky. Let's have a listen to DP Review TV, Chris Nichols. And we've known that from the mock-ups, but what really surprises you when you pick it up is actually how light it is. So this is about 1,015 grams. That's essentially half a knock. That's 2.237692 pounds roughly, actually pretty precisely, and that's with the battery in. So I like that it's got a nice stable feel to it. It's comfortable, but certainly much lighter than a 1DX3. Now, despite this camera being quite... So I looked it up and the uh, 5D, uh, the Canon 5D4, weighs uh, a little over two pounds. So the R3 is literally weighing roughly what a 5D weighs. And that is with a battery grip, that's with the, the integrated battery, similar to this, with the beefier, chunkier uh, battery that gives you a little bit more battery life than your standard LPE6 battery. And again, uh, if you're a Sony listener, which I know a lot of you guys are Sony uh, people, um, if you're a Fuji shooter, if you're a Panasonic boy, uh, you know, you're probably listening. Uh, I'm completely leaving out you Nikon people. I know you're out there. I've got some Nikon shooters uh, that listen to this show. You're probably frustrated that I'm going on and on about the R3. I think it's important uh, to to learn about every camera that's out there. Um, and to be honest, there is something about Canon, whether you're a Sony fanboy or a Fuji girl or a Nikon person, there's just something about the Canon brand that similar to Apple, which we're going to be talking about uh, later in this episode, the new iPhones, of course, which I am very excited about. Similar to Apple, Canon kind of just has this presence about them. And um, from the YouTuber perspective, from my experience reviewing cameras, if we did any review on a Canon camera, it did like 3x better performance than any other camera brand. Uh, Sony was definitely up there as well. Uh, but even with Fuji having such a dedicated fan base, um, the Canon videos just would always perform better. And it's not the really kind of, you know, it's not the working professional like people necessarily. It's, it's kind of everybody else, like, kind of your basic normal photographer, like, you know, mo soccer mom or soccer dad that goes out to buy a camera, they're probably going to go buy some sort of random Canon uh, Rebel camera, you know, at Best Buy. They're just going to walk in there and be like, I need a DSLR or nowadays they'll be like, you know, a mirrorless camera and they'll get an M50 or some sort of rebel, you know, like the T3i was so popular. How many of you guys remember the T3i? I think a lot of video shooters started out on that camera. I was a little older than that. I remember the T2i, that that was the camera that uh, my friends had. I personally was very lucky. Uh, my first camera in the DSLR world was the original Canon 7D, which did share the same sensor as the T3i. So I guess in a way it's the same. Uh, but it was more rugged and, you know, had some more pro photo features in particular. Uh, video features are actually essentially identical. Um, but anyways, I'm going on a tangent. The EOS R3, I think it's fascinating that 
it is a beefy big boy when you look at it in the pictures it looks like you know it looks similar to the 1dc that i'm holding here um, but it actually weighs roughly what a 5d weighs so if you kind of remember what your basic dslr feels like it's going to weigh roughly around that weight um, but it has a flip screen which is awesome uh, one thing that I was told when I went to events back in the day, you remember going to events, of course, uh, I miss it dearly. Um, my friend Photo Joseph, who we've had on the show, posted a, a photo today on Twitter. Um, here, I'm going to have to pull it up. Of the whole group, we in 2019 at NAB, we went to uh, this Atomos party and... Uh, it was so fun. There's so many uh, familiar faces in this photo here. Um, you can see there's Joseph, the C70, or what's his name? The C, the C, the C47. <laughs> there's Jevin. Um, there's uh, Caleb Pike is in here. There's Rod, uh, Rodney. Uh, this is terrible. I'm gonna be trying to name everybody, and I, I can't remember everybody's names, unfortunately. There's Gerald. There's Curtis. There's Dan Chung. Eric Naso. Connor's here. Um, it was a ton of fun just going to events, and that was one of the things really that made me fall in love with uh, YouTube is the people, the community, and all you guys who listen and um, people who would uh, just, I would meet at the con like people who go to NAB are like-minded people. It's people who do what we do. And um, I think if, whether you're a photographer or a videographer uh, you know, it, when you go to an event with other people like you, it's so refreshing uh, unless you happen to live in a city where you're surrounded by a lot of, of like-minded people or, or other filmmakers or photographers, you know, you live maybe in an industry city or town like LA or New York. Um, it is just so special to go to an event and like, just be surrounded by people who love the same things you love. And, um, that's something that's just deep in our core as humans that, uh, is so crucial. And it was something that just gave me so much fire under my feet to like go out there and create, uh, when I would meet up with, with you guys, and uh, it looks like, again, this year, I'm I'm not going to be going to NAB. I thought I was, but it's just not going to work out with work. And um, the whole COVID thing, it looks like everybody's pulling out. Like some of the big uh, brands have, have pulled out of NAB. So it's kind of like, what's the point? If, if you're not going to get hands-on with the R3 or some of these big cameras that were announced, um, you know, what's, what's the point? And it, it seems like nobody else is really going. I don't, I don't know. If you're going, let me know. But... Anyways, um, oh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, so at the event, at the, that was a big rabbit trail. I'm sorry about that. So at NAB, uh, I think in 2019, I was talking to a Canon rep, and he was telling me about the the lens design for Canon, and they really have done a wonderful job with their RF lenses. I just wish they would make more of them, for goodness sakes. Um, but they're balanced so well uh, for the mirrorless bodies. So yes, if you're a Canon shooter and you happen to own a bunch of EF lenses, like my cousins, Amy and Jordan, they shoot on the 5D4 and they have a ton of lenses. They've invested ten, you know, over $10,000 into lenses. Um, so they don't want to have to buy a bunch of lenses. You could use an adapter and everything works fine. But you really, truly, to get the best, most native experience, you really do want to get the RF lenses. Unfortunately, I mean, it, it is a big switch to make when you go to Sony or, or Nikon or Fuji, any of these mirrorless systems when you're coming from a, another system. It is a big deal to, like, sell all your lenses. And, uh, you know, if you have a bunch of stuff, you want to buy adapters to save money. I don't know. I, for me personally, using so many different cameras, using so many different adapters... It just, autofocus has gotten so good. The IBIS is so crucial now. Like, to get the most native experience on any camera, um, using native lenses is the way to go. Uh, obviously, with Micro Four Thirds, you do have Olympus lenses and Panasonic lenses. I'm using the uh, Panasonic 15 millimeter Sumalux lens. It's actually not. It's the DJI one. But anyways, um you know, and obviously there's third parties that make lenses too, like Tamron and Sigma, and they're great people. But basically going true native without an adapter is really the way to go. So 
Anyways, um, R3 with a bunch of RF lenses, it's going to be getting real expensive. I mean, you're looking at spending like 10 grand on this whole setup. Um, but this is not abnormal for this kind of world. When you're talking about flagship cameras, this is how much they cost. Uh, I believe the 1DX series is about that much, if not more. Um, was it, what are we on now? We're on the, we on the Mark three. Is it the, the newest one? Yeah, it's more. So the, the one DX Mark three, which is a beefy, uh, DSLR, um, is $6,500. So, and Canon has already said that they've discontinued making EF lenses. So if you spent $6,500 on a 1DX Mark III right now, um, you better, you know, have a reason for it. Um, you know, we've talked to Jamie Price, who's a, a, an amazing sports um, motocross, uh, motorsport uh, photographer. And he kind of explains why these cameras are the tools for these types of people. And uh, you should definitely listen to our, our podcast. Look at some of these photos here. I'm pulling them up. I mean, he is just phenomenal. He's actually been kind of blowing up on, uh, on TikTok because he is always at these huge races and he just does all these crazy things. Uh, and he just has these gorgeous photos. Like you think about, these sports photographers and motor motorsport photographers. And you kind of think about like, Oh, they're, there's, they're just the people like documenting the pictures that are going to be in the paper, or, you know, in the, in, on the websites and, and things like that. And, and Jamie talks about this in the podcast. He, that is part of the job. Like he is truly there to document events so that news outlets can use those photos. But all these all these guys and girls who do this are artists and you look at Jamie's photos and I, it's just like the composition and the the shutter speed where he, you're conveying motion through having a motion blur in the shot intentionally to convey you know speed and motion it's just so cool and the compositions are gorgeous so I mean now that I'm a Formula One fan like seeing all these photos is pretty cool <clears throat> so anyways, um, there is a reason that these, the one DX Mark three still exists and it's $6,500. It's because the Olympics just happened. It's because, uh, you know, we have so many people taking photos of, of political things. We have people taking photos of all sorts of sports that are happening all the time. And those types of people are just used to this type of body and they have a whole slew of lenses uh, that actually don't even exist on RF yet. We're talking, you know, 500, 500 millimeter lenses from Canon. So before people switch over fully, um, Canon's going to have to start creating some RF lenses for those types of shooters. So um, again, if you're a video shooter, I highly recommend the C70. It's $5,500. It's $500 less, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. So um Gordon Lang, another um, YouTuber who got some hands-on with it. His review is great as well. Uh, he's very technical and goes over a lot of the details. I highly recommend listening to it um, or, you know, watching it. Um, DP Review TV was fabulous. Uh, Chris kind of talks about the eye control feature, which sounds completely bizarre. Let's actually listen to it right now. It alone. We're gonna have to share. All right, so we're about to get shooting. There's a lot of different autofocus settings I gotta get a handle on, but let's talk about my initial settings here. I definitely wanna test out eye control autofocus. So I've got the bank that I've chosen. Now I'm gonna do multiple calibrations and the more data you give the camera, the better a job it should do. So I could do uh, calibrations under sunny conditions like we have today, cloudy conditions I would do indoors, absolutely. Uh, having the camera- Okay, so basically if you're not familiar with this feature, essentially, what this is, is the camera is now apparently able to track what your eye is looking at and can and basically move the focus point where you're looking. So Chris is literally talking about calibrating 
<laughs> the eye sensor on the camera, I control calibration um, and then eye control in general. Uh, he goes on to talk about how useful it is. And then at the end of his video, he says, once you use this feature, it's really hard to go back to any camera because it is a little, you know, it, it, of course it's in beta here that they were using a beta unit. And over time through software updates, this will get better. Of course, um, that's how all these cameras are. Usually over a period of years, the cameras continue to get better. And I don't, ex you know, I would expect the R3 to do the same. But he said, for the most part, it works f like flawlessly with some exceptions. And it, they weren't really able to show it in this film, in this video, because the, it doesn't show through the HDMI. So uh, Jordan wasn't able to record uh, the screen. But Chris talks about how just amazing it works. I mean, this is like f crazy, like futuristic stuff. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm being a little uh, crazy for saying this, um, but that just sounds absurd that you put your you put the camera to your eye and you start kind of looking around and then it just focuses on stuff. I mean, it, it's crazy vertical orientation so I've done multiple calibrations pretty simple it basically just directs you to look at a point hit the manual function button and then it stores that and then you'll get a calibration after multiple changes I'm setting up my camera here getting it ready to shoot you can actually store eye control settings in six banks so we're just gonna you know keep track of whose number is who and that way we can reset the camera for each person very quickly and easily. The other thing too, of course, is we can store the camera settings on our individual memory cards. So I'm gonna do that as well. So let's, that, let's listen to this here, sir. A visual of how the eye control is working and tracking things. So really he's talking about quite how- dynamic, but it actually won't pass it through to the Ninja. Yeah, yeah, so here he's talking about how you can't really see the eye control. The up to the EVF because then there's no eyeball for it to actually show the tracking. So the soccer pitch is a very good test just because we have multiple players out here, lots of faces. So Chris uh, right is on a soccer field. He's he's photographing um, a bunch of so kids, far, the you know, pretty kicking well. the ball. Look at a particular player, engage the shutter. It seems to be choosing that person's face. So I'm pretty impressed with that so far. Um, as well, I'm also finding that I'm using the zone setup a lot because you can customize the shape and size of that. So. For example, for soccer, I'm actually setting up sort of a people-shaped zone, skinny but tall, and then as long as I get my subject in that box, I can use my eye detect on the back button. It's locking onto that person as well. So it's very quick. I don't have to worry about recomposing. So of course, when you're shooting sports. Wow, I don't, I don't know if you're. Uh, this is conveying for our audio listeners. Uh, I would encourage all of you to go to DP Review TV and watch the Canon EOS R3 first impressions review video. Um, and by the way, I am good friends with Jordan and Chris personally. Uh, they are amazing people, uh, fathers, husbands, great, great guys. Um, love their stuff. So essentially, they're using a combination of things that we already have. You know, zone focusing is really useful. You're able to kind of designate a sliver of of the frame that you know your subject's going to be in, or at least compositionally where you want it to be. Um, and then the autofocus points kind of do their thing. But sometimes if you have multiple people in the frame and they come in and out, the face tracking may not, you know, kick in or whatever. Now with the eye, with the eye selection feature, he's able to look at the person that he wants to be in focus within that zone window. And it tracks it. it I can't wait to get my hands on this camera and try this for myself. It seems too good to be true, but based off of what Chris is saying in the video, this seems really uh, promising and super impressive. Um, and Sony does not have anything like this. Um, they obviously have an A7S III, which is an amazing tool, and their cameras have continued to get better and better and better. But, um, I mean, Canon speaks for themselves. The, the color science still continues to be solid. Their lens lineup is getting better. It's still not as robust and, and crazy awesome as Sony. Um, but they have the essentials uh, and they're continuing to add more to their lineup. Um, I'm not sure if many sports people are going to be picking this up. But for some reason, according to Jamie in the interview that I did with him, Jamie Price, there is a hesitancy with a lot of sports photographers with mirrorless. Uh, but a camera like this really seems like this is the future for sure. Um, 
this sex this section here the ovf simulation i want to play this section for you uh, i find this really interesting it's basically a mode with the camera that simulates an optical viewfinder so with my 1DC, you know, it's a mirror. And every time I click the button, the mirror flaps up. That's what a DSLR is, an SLR, single lens reflex. You're looking through a prism that looks down at a mirror that then f mechanically flips up and down. I mean, this is like ancient dinosaur technology. But throughout the years, mirrorless has been a bit of a, a, a hard thing for people who are used to DSLRs. And one of the main things that a lot of DSLR advocates say that they prefer is having the optical viewfinder so that they can see what's happening in real life. Um, they don't need to see what color profile they're shooting on because you already set that. Or if you're shooting in raw, it doesn't matter anyways. And you're able to look at, you know, your levels and stuff to, to judge your exposure. But DSLR advocates, you know, prefer to be able to basically see reality how reality is. And this is the first time I've ever heard of anything that's this uh, good um, with essentially simulating that experience that so many DSLR shooters are used to. It's called OVF simulation. When we have a full production camera. I'll talk about the EVF here. It's a very high spec EVF, 5.76 million dots. You can have it refresh up to 120 frames per second, which has been great for the sports action and wildlife that we've been shooting today. But it does also have an optical viewfinder simulation mode. And this is meant to mimic a true optical viewfinder out of an SLR. It's a feature which we kind of would at first thought think is a silly feature, but we've actually all been using and enjoying. So the idea is this. That's fascinating, first off, it but turns they off all like it. Simulation. So, as I change exposure manually or with exposure comp, it does not reflect that change in the viewfinder. It also turns off any sort of um, profiles that you may have set as far as color and contrast. So if I go to black and white mode, the optical viewfinder sim is still in color. So if it's turning off all of the things that we consider benefits to an electronic viewfinder, then why use it? Well, it's because it does make use of the HDR display that we have in the EVF. And this gives us- Okay, I feel like I'm starting to hear like Jordan sending me a DM right now and saying, Dave, you used my entire video in your video. Um, I will go ahead and say this is fair use. Look at this picture in picture right now. Listen to me talking. This is fair use. I'm allowed to do this, Jordan and Chris. Don't get mad at me. Also, everybody go watch the whole thing. I'm not going to give away any more of their video. I want to support all my YouTuber friends. I know Jordan sometimes listens to the podcast. I'm not going to go ahead and say that he listens to every podcast. Um, but if he happens to be listening to this podcast, or if somebody sends him a clip of me going on a rant about the fact that Jordan doesn't watch the podcast, so therefore the people who listen to it send it to him, and then he can just kind of pretend like he listens to it. Uh, Jordan, this is fair use. This falls under fair use. Don't sue me. Uh, I love your channel. I love what you guys are doing. And, uh, I'm not going to give away any more of your video. Everybody go watch it. Um, for video stuff, uh, Jordan does talk a little bit here at the end. Uh, I'm not going to give away what he has to say. Um, let's just say this is not a video camera. If you want a video camera that costs roughly the same price that's way better, buy the freaking C70. Will you just do it? Don't complain. Please don't complain anymore. The C70 exists. And the C70 is awesome. I think the R5, all the issues that we had with the R5, with the overheating, could have completely been resolved if the C70 came out at the same time as the R5. Because I use the C70 almost every day now with my job. I love it. It's, it's a serious workhorse tool. Uh, and if you are a video person and you're listening to me talk about the R3 and you're, you're waiting for Jordan's review on the R3 for video... Just take my word for it, and I would imagine that Jordan would say the same thing. Buy a camera that's a video camera. And in his case, that's an S1H, uh, but that is a video camera. And lots of other people have decided to switch over to the A7S III, which is also primarily a video camera, even though it's in a hybrid body. Uh, although some people may argue that it's not, but I, I don't know. Get a video camera that's made for video. That's all I have to say. Although I'm sure the R3 looks great and will be a good camera. Uh, it's just going to have a lot of limitations that other video cameras 
will resolve. So anyways, go watch DP Review TV's uh, video on the R3. Go watch Gordon Lang. Um, Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com did a video as well. Go watch R3 stuff. It's a fascinating camera. I'm excited about it. And I think it'll be um, really, really popular. So Canon R3 coming in hot. That's number one. That's the first thing that kind of happened today. Um, now, before we get to the main event, which is the new iPhone, I want to give a shout out uh, to uh, Norm McDonald who passed away today. Uh, very tragic and, and too young. I mean, everybody says that, right? But he was, he was 61. And uh, he died of cancer. And uh, I really, truly love his sense of humor, his comedy. Uh, my grandpa had the exact same dry sense of humor. If you've never listened to Norm MacDonald... Do yourself a favor. Go watch some of his stuff. It is hysterical. Um, his style of comedy is kind of a lost art in the comedy world. Uh, he is excruciatingly offensive, but it's all in it's all comedy, and and you know it. And because of who he is, he's able to get away with it. Um, but he is hilarious. I love this tweet that I saw today. It's a quote from him. It says, I'm pretty sure I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure if you die, the cancer dies at the same time. That's not a loss. That's a draw. So very true. Norm McDonald rest in peace. Uh, that's a draw on the cancer for sure. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to give, you know, just put that out there into the internet uh, because I'm a big fan and, you know, some of you guys m might have no heard that or not. There was a lot of news today, so um, really crazy. Um, so the iPhone event was today, the Apple event, Apple Day. Um, if you're on Twitter, you knew that already because everybody's tweeting about it. Um you know, we, there were some rumors about the Apple Watch uh, being square that ended up not being true. The Apple Watch is actually rounded, um, <laughs> which uh, in the rumor world was like a big shock. That I, f I found that kind of funny. Um, but there's two products in particular that I would like to highlight uh, for this show because they are relevant for this show. Now, if you want to learn more about the event as a whole... There are so many other podcasts and shows out there that are talking about other YouTubers. MKBHD, I think, posted a video today. I'm sure every tech reviewer is going to post a video tomorrow about it. Um, you know, it's this is the biggest Apple news of the whole year, essentially, because uh, the iPhones are the most popular products you know that Apple makes. Um, but first off, I'd like to highlight the new iPad Mini. So the iPad mini has been around for a while. I remember when the first one came out, I bought, I bought the very first iPad mini um, because I felt like the, the older iPads were a little big and clunky and I would never take it around with me. And I just figured, hey, the iPad mini might be a better tool for me because I can just put it in my bag and it's way more convenient. And at the time, you know, I think it was like rocking an iPhone 4, you know, so my phone was tiny. So it was really the perfect middle ground um, for somebody who also owns a laptop. I think that was the biggest thing is like when you own a laptop, why would you also carry around a 10 inch tablet, you know, all the time? Um, and so I got the iPad mini and it kind of filled that tablet need that I that I had of reading books and you know watching YouTube videos and stuff like that uh, bigger than a phone but not super big that you know bringing a laptop feels a little redundant or whatever or or vice you know or the flip side bringing an iPad is redundant because you have a laptop and can I just go ahead and say like if you are an iPad owner you probably watch Netflix on it or you know YouTube and stuff like that. That's probably what you do most of the time. If you're a video or photo editor, you probably also own a laptop. 
why is it that we, I say collectively we, own iPads and laptops and we choose the iPad to watch TV shows and stuff when the laptop is is better. It's a bigger screen. It is still compact enough that you could sit in your bed and watch it. The speakers are great. Like, I don't know. I Sometimes I feel kind of silly, like sitting in my bed watching a movie on my iPad because I'm having to hold it, you know, because the little foldy stand thing is terrible, like when it's sitting on a pillow. And I'm like, man, a laptop would be so much better right now. It just like sit on my stomach perfectly on a pillow or something. And then it folds up and it doesn't wiggle. It, like it, it has some gravity to it. So it's not going to fall over all over the place. I don't know. I feel like in this first world that we live in, so many people own iPads just because you maybe you bought it like three, four years ago and you just held on to it. Um, and it just seems so redundant to have all these different devices that essentially all do the same thing. But I don't know. The reason that I'm bringing up the iPad mini is I see a lot of use cases for us photography related video people. There are so many different apps for all different cameras. I'd say every camera that exists has uh, an accompanying app to it of some sort. Panasonic is probably the best. Um, Panasonic has some of the best iPhone camera apps, in my opinion, at least back when I was testing these things and reviewing them. Uh, Fuji is, is decent. Sony has gotten much better over the years, but still a little buggy. I feel like every camera related app in the app store has like a one or two star review, uh, average. Um, I say they're all fairly buggy and never perfect. Um, but I found the Panasonic one to be pretty good. You could change focus uh, on it, which is crucial with those cameras. Cause you can't, you, know, <laughs> you can't, uh, really trust the autofocus. Um, the Red Komodo has its own app, which is cool. Um, I think the C70 has some sort of Wi-Fi Im implementation. I haven't looked into it, actually. <clears throat> but having a small device that you can have, whether you're on set and you're behind the camera or if you know, you're know you doing an interview, you can have a, an iPad mini, which is really the perfect size, um, rather than this clunky device, you know, uh, like a standard 10 inch iPad. It's really the perfect tool for, um, I'm going to show this picture. It's really the perfect tool for like a working, uh, cinematographer or photographer. Not only can you use it as, you know, camera control, there's all sorts of different apps as well that exist for, for other things. You know, uh, black magic has their own things for like the switchers, uh, the the ATM Mini, you know, there's an app for that. There's uh, audio apps where you can control your audio settings. Um, GoPro has their own app. Um, obviously, if you're doing drone stuff and you're flying a drone, the iPad Mini is the perfect size. Uh, you know, if you have a mount for it that that works well. Obviously, the uh, you know, the Mavic Mini and the Mavic Air are designed for phones to be mounted there. And phones are, are great, but sometimes that screen just isn't big enough, but a standard iPad is just way too big. And so you can see in this photo here how it fits in a standard person's hand here. Um, the actual screen size itself is what? Uh, eight inches, I think, is what I remember. Um and essentially, they've updated it with all the modern stuff. So it's got the the modern processor, the A15 processor. It's got 5G. So if you want to to spend a little extra money, you can get 5G and pay for Verizon or AT&T or whatever, or wherever you live. You know, you can have internet no matter where you go on the device, which is awesome. It's kind of just a giant phone. Um, and it's got a USB-C port, which really integrates perfectly with the pro devices. You know, it integrates perfectly with your computer. Uh, if you have a Mac or even a modern PC, you've got a P, uh, USB-C. You know, it's, it's obviously an iPad too. So it's got a selfie screen for FaceTime calls and Zoom calls and stuff. And then uh, the back camera is, I think, a camera from a couple years ago. So it's it's not a, a great camera, uh, but it is there if you, if you want it. Um, and then the app, Apple Pencil is on it as well. Uh, the, the new Apple Pencil magnetically attaches to the side. And it's kind of hilarious because the Apple Pencil, as you can see in this video or this photo here, is essentially the length of the entire uh, device, 
Now there's no keyboard for it. I think it would just be a little too small. Um, but I feel like this really is the perfect kind of a accompanying tool for a working professional, uh, whether you're a photographer or a videographer. Um, now, obviously, if you could say the same thing about any iPad, um, the thing that makes this great is, you know, the for example, the Atomos uh, Ninja recorder. I'm actually using it as a monitor right now. You can see maybe the switcher here. That, that's the A10 Mini output is on this. I'm using it as a display. And the Inferno monitors were the first recording monitors from them, from Atomos. They were seven inches and they were huge when you put them on a camera. They were just way too big. And the Ninja has just been wildly popular because it is kind of the perfect size to go on top of most cameras. It's not too big, it's not too small. And I found the five inch display, even though it's technically worse than a seven inch display because seven inches is bigger and you can see more and, and whatever. I found the, the Ninja 5, the five inch version, it, it, that's the right size for this tool, for this use case. And I believe personally that the the iPad mini, uh, especially now with this nice bezel-less design, all the new modern processors, which will, will last you a long time, built in 5G, all that type of stuff. This is going to be a, a powerful tool for people um, on the go, uh, shooting, or in my case right now, I could have an Olympus app off to the side here and control my settings um, on just a nice iPad that's kind of the right size for this use case. Sitting here at my table, um, it would be the right size for this particular use case. So maybe I'm crazy, call me crazy. I feel like this is the right size iPad for the type of work that we collectively do. Now, if you're a photographer that edits primarily on an iPad, then that's a completely different conversation. And my good friend, Drew Chanelli, Drew Photo, who we've had on the show, um, he is 100% an iPad editor. And he swears by that 12-inch iPad Pro with the M1 processor in it. That's a completely different conversation. If you're using your iPad as your primary, your primary um, editing device, uh, whether you're doing video editing um, on it or photo editing, then then obviously you want to get as much screen real estate as you can. And the 12-inch version is the same size effectively as my 13-inch MacBook Pro that's sitting here on this desk. So that's a completely different conversation. I'm just saying as a tool for uh, drone work, uh, controlling your camera, controlling focus, uh, if you have a Panasonic camera that isn't good at focus, or a Komodo, which isn't the best at focus either, or you just want to have something that you could use as, a, as a, an additional monitor or display, um, or in this, uh, because of the size of it, it's just kind of the perfect um, kind of moleskin notebook in, in a way. Um, you know, it's it's really just the best thing to kind of carry around, make some notes, write your scripts, write your write things down. If you go to a coffee meeting with a client, you bring this, you write down notes. Uh, it's the right size. Will I be buying one? I don't know. Probably not. (laughs) All that being said, uh, it isn't cheap. They start at 499 with the Wi-Fi version. Um, you know, you could tether from your phone so you don't have to get the cellular version, but if you get cellular, it bumps up to, uh, to uh, 649 and that's only with a 64 gig version the maximum is 256 with cellular you're looking at 800 bucks i mean the atomos ninja is what 500 bucks so i guess it's you know if you're talking about uh ninja v let me look if you're talking about professional video monitors and stuff yeah i mean that's 600 dollars actually the ninja 5 so if you're talking about a professional tool um you know, that's in line and it's, and you can watch Netflix on it too. You know, um, if you are an iPhone pro max owner, which I am, it does seem a little redundant to have a device. That's honestly not much bigger than this. However, there is something to say about having a dedicated device for 
that use case. Again, this is first world, but it might not even be considered a first world when I'm talking about it in relation to a tool for your work. I see this as a valuable tool um, for the, the work that we do. And having a, a device that, you know, your wife or, or your friends aren't texting all the time that, that can be removed from that, that is a dedicated tool. Uh, this is great. It's obviously to a great tool for teleprompters as well. It's, it's compact. So you can put on a mirrorless camera and, and use a smaller prompter and not have to have a massive prompter. So I don't know. I just see it as a valuable thing. And also it's the perfect size for a kid, but I, I wouldn't spend $500 on an iPad for a kid uh, to watch Baby Bum and Paw Patrol on. Uh, that's that's unnecessary. Just buy an old iPad mini for like 200 bucks on eBay or whatever. That's really all you need for that. But anyways, that's the first thing I wanted to bring up. And the second in our kind of grand finale of this episode is of course the brand new iPhone 13. Um, where's my picture picture? There it is. So the iPhone 13 pro, uh, the iPhone 13, and the 13 Pro, uh, they aren't a huge update really from the 12. Um, but there's some things in particular that I want to talk about with video when it comes to the 13 Pro. Now, apparently the 13 and the 13 Mini, which exists, the, the 13 Mini still exists. I think a lot of people were worried that that was going to go away. Uh, but they're still doing a Mini and a standard size. They now have the same cameras as the um, as the Pro Max, essentially. So you have the bigger sensor that the Pro Max had last year, which is cool. Um, but for the most part, it's the same. It, it is actually the same camera. Now you, it's not going to look the same because you do have a newer processor, and it, you know that always gives you better performance. But what I really want to show you guys is the 13 Pro and some of the new features here. I've heard rumors about a lot of things, and we talked about them on the show last week. The ProRes, which came. Uh, you can now shoot ProRes video on the Pro. Man, the, their websites are so dumb, the way that it kind of like... I'm just scrolling, and it's like doing all these crazy animations as I scroll. I, I don't know. I'm not a fan of that. You know what I'm talking about if you've been on any Apple website. It's kind of cool, I mean, in some ways, but it's also sort of annoying when I'm looking for stuff. So first off... You can do macro photography, macro video uh, on the wide angle lens. That's cool. Moment, I'm sure, wasn't happy about that. But you can see from this image, uh, you're able to get really close. Uh, you can focus up to two, uh, you can close as, focus as close as two centimeters. Um, there is some crazy chromatic distortion on the corners you can't see in this photo, but. Uh, in some of their examples, I saw that. So it's definitely nowhere near a real good lens, but it's cool that it's there. Um, you now have night mode on the wide and the telephoto lenses. The uh, telephoto lens has been zoomed in from 56 millimeters on the Pro Max to now the 77 millimeters on both cameras, on the Pro and the Pro Max. Uh, so... Essentially, you have like a super wide, a medium, and then a, a nice portrait telephoto at 77 millimeters. So um, very cool. Uh, some people are upset about that because they, they feel like that's a little too much of a zoom in. But I believe that that's the right move because the main camera is used so much. And I find that I'm I'm looking for the actual settings here the actual you have a telephoto wide ultra wide they're not telling me the millimeter on here that's stupid equivalent um i find that 77 millimeter like on my pro max it's a 56 millimeter zoom which is more than the main zoom or is it 65 oh my gosh you guys are probably like rolling your eyes as i say all this it's a 2.5x zoom on the pro max and that was like an upgrade, if you will, compared to the uh, previous year. A little more zoomed in, basically. Some people are like, ah, oh, I don't want that. It's too zoomed in. I want 2x, not 2.5x. Well, now it's even more. I guess it's 3x now with the 77. Um, 
I found that this 2.5 X was great. It's basically having an 80, 80, 80 millimeter lens in your pocket. Uh, well, now it is with 77 millimeter. Oh my gosh, I'm going in circles. It's like a 65 on this. Anyways, you know, you guys know why you want a, a good portrait lens. Guys, it's late. I'm shooting this at 12 right now. It's, it's midnight as I'm recording this. So give me a break. I've been working all day and then I do this podcast for you guys. <clears throat> um, I'm excited about this portrait lens on the iPhone. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, I'm kind of glossing over some of the other things here. You know, for the most part, it's going to look very similar to last year in terms of the photo quality. Um, I'm sure it'll be a little cleaner and better, but this is kind of the, the big thing here. Cinematic mode. Now you guys may have, if you've been on the internet in the last 24 hours, you know about this already, but cinematic mode. First off, I hate the name. Could have thought about that a little more. Um, cinematic mode. Basically it's portrait mode for video. Um, here's the example though. They're using LiDAR on the camera, which LiDAR is a little sensor that detects depth. So they're able to d determine through the LiDAR sensor how far an object is away from the camera. So it's using that data to determine where the subject is that you're focusing on. And then it uses software to blur the background and it does it incrementally. You can't just do a, a Gaussian blur on the whole thing behind the subject because then it would just it would look weird it'd look like a green screen or like a weird photoshop thing or like a zoom call have you ever seen people on zoom and they put like bokeh behind them but it just looks stupid um that's what it would look like the bokeh is gradual just like a lens and it's it's doing that through software um just like portrait mode um but they're using all the technology they've developed over the years with portrait mode in this feature with the video and it looks pretty good now obviously they're showing a good example of it here on the website um i've pulled up a video uh that was shot by a famous director and dp uh, i'll watch it here and you can sort of see some image issues some artifacts just kind of that standard stuff that you see with portrait mode where the edges are a little blurred in a weird way but to a normal person and especially to somebody watching this on a phone uh, they're not going to really notice. And I found this really amazing. Obviously, you have a bunch of actors. It's well lit. You know, there's a whole crew here. Um, you know, your, mile, your mileage may vary when you're filming your kids. It's not going to look great with mixed lighting and stuff. But that's, that's the case with any camera. Um, however, a proper and real camera can make crappy lighting and crappy scenes look way better than an iPhone just because the sensor is bigger and because, you know, better color science and whatever. But all that being said, I was really impressed with this film here called Who Done It? And it's on the Apple's YouTube channel. So you can see a little rack focus. It's a car, the rack focus on the background, shot on iPhone 13. You see a background image, a photo is missing, and then a hand comes into the Im uh, into the frame. If rack focuses on that, rack focusing is something that I feel like all of us did when we first got a brand new DSLR, like the 5D Mark II. It was like, I'm going to rack focus on everything. And then, like, that doesn't make things cinematic. Like, you have to have a reason for it. And obviously, you know, the filmmakers who made this uh, had a reason, you know, it wasn't there wasn't it wasn't like stupid the, the way they did it um but it is kind of stupid also um also this is a total ripoff of knives out let's just be honest it's like a who done it type of thing i mean that's literally what it's called so but it's okay so as you're watching this you have you have a bunch of subjects in the background you have your protagonist in the foreground he's in focus everybody behind him is out of focus blurry Again, to our audio listeners, I'm trying to describe it to you. It's well lit. Um, honestly, if you screenshotted this image 
and just uploaded it to Instagram or, or, or whatever. And you didn't talk about the iPhone at all. And you just said, Oh man, look at this short film I'm working on or whatever. I feel like nobody would catch some of the image issues here. There's some issues in his hair and around his ear and his collar where you can see some of the blur effect that the portrait mode creates. I feel like most people would completely not even notice that. Um, again, this is this mode in its best. Apple's always going to show you its best, uh, what's capable at its highest level uh, with professionals, with full control of lighting, of acting, and blocking, all those types of things. But this frame as it's uh, just by itself looks, it does look cinematic. And it's not just because of the blur. It's because of, like I said, the costuming, the setting, the lighting. But this is a first for the iPhone because Steven Soderbergh is famous for doing a couple movies on the iPhone. He did Unsane, I think, is the horror film. And even with the advancements with Filmic Pro and last year with the log profiles, you could not fake the depth of field issue. The fact that the camera sensor is so tiny on these phones, um, just with physics, you're never going to be able to create a cinematic, you know, in quotations, image because the sensor is just so tiny. And this image really sells it. It really sells the idea that this is the future and camera companies better buckle up and do something to compete because this is the very first iPhone with this feature and it looks really good and I cannot wait to see what they do with this technology moving forward. This is honestly, I hate to say the word, game changing. This really is and it's something that I, being in the camera review space uh, for the last couple of years, being a camera reviewer, um, I foresaw this happening with the LiDAR cameras, with some really interesting, um, or the, sorry, LiDAR camera, yeah, LiDAR cameras, LiDAR trackers, and also the Lytro cameras that allow you to change focus and post. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. There was a big, sh you know, they showed it at NAB one year. You could change focus and post using similar technology here, but with physical lenses and crazy algorithms and stuff. Basically what I have heard over the years is the future of cinematography is being able to essentially shoot, you know, on set, you know, you can have focus pullers on set and, and kind of have obviously you're blocking and everything's still traditional, but all the focus data is captured as like data that you can then change and post. You can change where the focus is in your NLE. You know, you could have perfect face tracking because you could either manually keyframe where you want the face to be in focus manually or have software that has face tracking in post-production, not on camera. Not to mention, once you start dealing with lenses that have all this type of depth data, you can now apply basically lens calibration tools are like lens simul si lens simulation uh, plugins and things. So you could literally just push a button and simulate an anamorphic lens. You could push a button and simulate a, a ret you know a retro lens from the 1800s that's worth you know half a million dollars or whatever. <clears throat> so this is the future of cinematography and we are getting closer and closer by the day. It may be another 20 years before it becomes a reality and it shows up on Hollywood because that tends to be the case um, with the higher end. I mean, only now are most everything being is most everything being shot digital uh, when everything else went digital a while ago. Film uh, in cinema remained fairly present up until a couple years ago. And now it's just kind of like Tarantino and Chris Nolan are the only people left doing it. And that's just because they're auteurs and they demand it, you know. Um, but from all practicality standpoint, it just it makes no logical sense to shoot film anymore. Um, people can debate that with me. But this frame, again, really sells this software. 
So you can see the rack focus on the people. There's just rack focuses everywhere. I think they kind of overdid it a little bit. Now, there was a shot here that kind of gives away the, the magic trick. And it's when it rack focuses on this lady. And for some reason, that just looks very iPhone-y. Um, I think it's because there's a bookcase behind her and everything is sharp. Uh, if this were a real lens on a real camera with a big sensor, that background would be fairly sharp because she's not too far away from it, but it would be blurred out. And in this case, the software is not f the, 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 the LIDAR tracking is not fine enough to be able to determine that, I think. That being said, the color science does look really good in this. And the overall image quality looks great. I mean, I'm, I've already kind of forgotten that I'm looking at an iPhone film because it just kind of looks very cinematic. And I would have probably have added a little bit more grain to the image to make it kind of blend in a little bit more. But I think they're just trying to show off what's possible here. Also, oh, by the way, update on my dad's movie. Um, my dad, last episode, I talked about my dad's film, Show Me the Father. It went to theaters last weekend, did great at the box office. Um, I got to go see it with my dad. And um, I'm only bringing that up because I was about to say, I've shot stuff, you know, I shot stuff with my dad and I got to see it on a real theater. And it's amazing how much the theater screen like softens things in a good and pleasing way. It, you could take a 1080p image that you just shoot on a 5D, blow it up on a theater screen, and you wouldn't really be able to tell. It looks cinematic, looks beautiful. And I would say that this would be the case here with the iPhone. I bet if you put this short film on a real theater screen, it would look incredible. There's some sort of magic that goes on there. I think it's just the distance between the projector and the screen. It's the fact that it's just blown up on a big big screen. It just kind of softens everything, and it just does it in a pleasing way. So this probably would look great. So anyways, you kind of, you guys kind of get the idea. He finds, you know, he, he thinks it's this guy and then it's, it's not, it's the kid, right? So just gave it away. But all in all, real impressed with this little short film. It really kind of shows again, the, the best of the best here. Um, your mileage may vary. There's one thing that I was on the lookout for in all of the iPhone ads and that was any type of highlight flickering or tone mapping. This is, again, something I talked about in the previous episode. Uh, Michael Tobin talks about this in his videos all the time. Basically, with the 12 Pro Max, no matter what you do, even when you shoot in Filmic Pro in the log format, and you lock your exposure, and you lock, you know, you lock your ISO, you lock your shutter speed, no matter what you do, there's just this kind of HDR flickering kind of going on, and it's from the tone mapping, the HDR effect that happens on the camera and for some reason they don't give filmic pro access to disable this hdr uh, effect and even if you disable hdr on your phone it's still subtly there it's a huge tell that you're shooting on an iphone um, i hope that now with the cinematic mode um, they when you go into that mode that you're able to lock it out or, or at least give filmic pro access to lock your exposure like a real camera um the image that you're looking at right now on my olympus camera you know it's just locked and loaded it's even if i move my head around and things are changing like it's not going to change the image will not shift in color or flicker in any way um so that's one of the things i was looking out for i didn't see any flicker in this short film um but i haven't seen any specific uh, documentation or anybody talking about this. I've just kind of tweeted about it. Michael Tobin and uh, a couple others uh, responded and said that they were uh, Patrick Tommaso uh, also was talking about that. So um, ProRes is coming uh, in the future. It's not here yet, um, but we will be able to get ProRes recording on camera. Uh, that'll be great. I hope Filmic Pro again gets access to that because then we're talking log with ProRes, with this cinematic mode, 
Now we're talking. And the kind of icing on top with the cinematic mode, it's one thing to do it, you know, in camera and bake it in and you have this file, you know, that's that looks like a real camera. But what if you made a mistake with your focus pull or, you know, maybe it's a little off and you, you really wanted to focus on a different subject? Well, in the Photos app on your phone, you can go in there and change your focus in post. Uh, it's really quite amazing. Here's a little section. See how we trained your camera to be a cinematographer. So this is a nerd out. It says nerd out and read this. So they, they've, they know this is nerdy talk. But to bring cinematic mode to iPhone, we carefully studied how master filmmakers use rack focus to add drama and emotion to the story. On Hollywood shoots, pulling focus requires a talented team of experts. Like a cinematographer who makes the overall call about what's in focus and when that changes. Blah, blah, blah. Uh... Making all this happen automatically on your iPhone was no small feat. First, we had to generate high-quality depth data so cinematic mode knows the precise distance to people, places, and pets in a scene. And because this is video, we needed that depth data, data continuously at 30 frames per second. We also trained the neural engine to work like the experts. It makes on-the-fly decisions about what should be in focus, and it applies smooth focus transitions when that changes. This is not something that I, uh, this is me talking now. That's actually not something that I heard in the keynote and not something that anybody else has really talked about. I think this is a huge factor that makes Apple different than Samsung, who's been doing this type of portrait mode with video for a while. And something that I hated about Sony up until now, and now, now their focus is pretty natural and I loved about Canon. Canon had a much more natural autofocus transition it looked like a human was doing it it was smooth it kind of like ramps in and ramps out and you know it's not always perfect but when it's even when it misses it it sort of looks like a human so the fact that apple is implementing this into uh, this setting is huge if you want the creative control you can always hop into the director's chair and rack focus manually either when you shoot or in the edit it's so computationally intense, we needed a chip that could handle the workload. Enter A15 Bionic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the sheer computational power needed to run the machine learning algorithms, render autofocus changes, support manual focus changes, and grade each frame in Dolby Vision all in real time is astounding. It's like having Hollywood in your pocket. You know, a little bit of marketing there, but they're not wrong. This is this is pretty this is a pretty awesome uh, new thing. So, um, let's see. Is there anything else here? Not really. I mean, again, the photos have always been good. Um, they're incrementally better because we have a newer processor in here. Uh, you can go up to a terabyte storage, which you're gonna need when you're shooting ProRes. That's for sure. Uh, ProMotion finally comes to the iPhone. Uh, so you can go up to 120 hertz on the display, um, which basically just makes everything look really smooth. But iOS 15 is optimized for ProMotion, so it basically changes the frame rate of your display depending on what you're looking at. So if you're like just looking at text on a screen, you're not even moving the text, It'll actually go all the way down to 10 frames per second because you're not even moving the screen. But once you start scrolling it, it detects your finger and it's fast enough to know that you're about to scroll or whatever. And then it ramps it up to 120. So it looks super fluid. Um, the reason they do that is because it saves a ton of battery life. Otherwise, you look at other Android phones that have 120 uh, hertz. It just drains your battery because it's basically always pumping 120 hertz even if you're not using it. Uh, so having something that's variable like this is crucial uh, to having good battery life. Gaming is great on it. 25% brighter outdoors. Um, that's good. I mean, if you're shooting a video outside, um, having a brighter screen is crucial. <clears throat> One thing that I found with the iPhone 12 Pro Max when I did my shoots, though, is that it overheats fairly quickly and then the screen dims. So I don't like that. Hopefully that'll go away. Um but that's pretty much it. iPhone 13 Pro Max is probably the one that I would get. Uh, it's got 5G, of course. You know, 
pretty exciting stuff. So thank you, Apple, for always, you know, innovating. Uh, this is, overall is a kind of an iterative phone. Uh, in past years, this would probably be an S model. This would be an iPhone 12 S. But Apple seems to have dropped that moniker, and now they're going numerically. So we're at iPhone 13, uh, which is great. If you already own an iPhone 12 or 12 Pro or 12 Pro Max, um, please don't be tempted by this, you know, if I'm going on and on, you know, if you already own a real camera, a good camera, you don't need this. Um, even if you uh, don't and you're considering this as a real camera, I wouldn't. I would still, of course, recommend a real camera uh, if you want to get into pro video and photo work. There's just something that a big sensor gives you that you're just not going to get at least yet with the iPhone. I think technology will catch up and it will potentially get there to where in a couple of years um, it will be indistinguishable. And that will be really interesting to see. We're still not there yet. It's still a little dirty. The image is a little muddy. Um, the Who Done It short film is, again, the iPhone at its best. Uh, if you're doing a real shoot with an iPhone, um, you're going to deal with battery drain issues because you're really burning the battery life when you're shooting in these high res modes. The screen brightness dims. Uh, you can't adjust the screen in any way. The screen is just, you know, bolted on to the back of the lens. So if you're shooting low angle, you can't see what you're filming because it's way down there. And, you know, having a flip screen on a real camera is great. Uh, you can't change the lenses physically. Obviously, you can buy a moment lenses and stuff, but it's not the same. So, obviously, if you're starting out and you're considering, should I buy the iPhone 13 Pro Max instead of a real camera? No, absolutely not. If you need a camera, uh, do your research. There's plenty of great cameras below $1,000, cheaper than the iPhone, that are going to look better. Uh, even a used you know, camera can do better, so... Uh, that being said, will I be getting one? Eh, probably not. I don't really have the money right now, and I'm not doing YouTube like I used to. Um, I would love if maybe a friend of mine gets one. I think Zach or Connor may get one or something. Maybe I could have them on the show, and they could talk about their experience. And um, If I were doing YouTube, I would be buying one immediately and doing a video on it. Uh, I think it's still fascinating and interesting, and we'll see what happens with it. Um, I think if you're starting out, if, if I were a kid, teenager, uh, I would ask my parents for one of these because you wouldn't even need a computer. You could literally just have an iPhone 13 Pro Max, shoot movies with your friends, edit them on your phone, record audio, do motion graphics. It's really quite incredible how powerful everything has gotten, how small it's gotten. This will be really empowering for uh, upcoming filmmakers and honestly, for us, uh, the majority of us who are pro working professional freelance filmmakers or even photographers, having a phone like this in your pocket as a backup isn't a bad idea. And don't like hesitate to use it anymore. I feel like we've now arrived at a point where you can mix iPhone footage with real footage and it's, it's good. It's totally good. Um, you know... You can maybe get a little iPhone mount, put it on top of your camera if you're shooting a wedding, for example. Have a real camera with the telephoto lens getting a nice close-up with some depth of field, you know, blur stuff that's real with a lens. And then just have an iPhone on top as a wide angle. And everything's in focus because it's just a wide angle. And the sharpness and quality of that image is so good now uh, that you can totally get away with using that in a, in a you know, consumer product like a wedding video. Um, yeah, I find that really fascinating and I'm really excited about the future. iPhone 13 Pro and then the iPad mini, uh, the brand new one. Very exciting products from Apple. The Canon EOS R3. This is just a gear focused video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, again, uh, my dad's movie, Show Me the Father, is still in theaters. Uh, they won a cinema score of, uh, they, or, I don't know, they won. They got a cinema score of an A+, plus, an A-plus cinema score, which if you're familiar with that rating system, it's really rare to get an A+. Very few movies get it each year. Uh, 
big directors like Steven Spielberg only have two movies that even got an A+. So huge deal for my dad. Really proud of him. Like I said, I got to see the movie in the theaters with him, with my mom and some of their friends. And, um, you know, the truth is, is not many people are going to the theaters uh, just in general because of COVID. So um, they're really hoping that over the next week or so, uh, some more people go see it. So if you haven't seen it, would you please do me a favor? Go to showmethefathermovie.com and you can buy tickets there uh, or just go to your local movie theater if you live in the United States and they're probably they probably have a showing. Um, it's literally in uh, almost all the movie theaters across the country. So go check it out. Once again, I'm your host, Dave Mays. This is the Golden Hour Podcast. We have some amazing guests lined up soon. Um, this was really a gear and tech-based show. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, and hopefully my live switching wasn't half bad. Thanks again, guys, for listening. It means the world to me. Tweet me or send me a message on Instagram at Dave Mays on Twitter at Dave Mays underscore on Instagram. And I'll see you next week. Bye.